All right, so welcome to Analyzing Public Comments 101, uh, hosted by Seam Social Labs. I will kind of kind of go through some housekeeping, ground rules, and some introductions, and then pass it over to Taeja to really get into the meat and potatoes of the conversation for today. So just so you all have an idea of who we are, uh, Seam Social Labs is a B Corp on a mission to empower community voices. Uh, we envision a world where solutions are co-created by communities and institutions, as opposed to solutions being created for communities by the institutions that serve them. We currently, we're a New York-based uh, startup, and we currently have two live products, one being our Cosensus SaaS platform. So Cosensus is a cloud-based cloud -based platform that transforms public, public feedback, or really any qualitative freeform data set into actionable insights in pretty much real time. Um, folks are able to launch SMS surveys on that platform, as well as import any kind of any kind of qualitative data set, such as the data sets we're gonna be looking at in the breakout rooms today. Uh, we also have CoLab, which is a digital learning lab, um, which includes online courses and content that's interactive and really is aimed to help folks uh, help folks in their understanding of what equitable and inclusive community engagement looks like. Um, and then we have uh, CoOpen Data, which is a private beta in which we're taking open data and launching it open data that was launched at CoSensus, um, converting into public data tools, really giving that data back to the people that provided it. Um, and the team, I'm James, as you all know, um, I and I lead CXA at CoSensus. Um, I will quickly pass it over to Autumn to go ahead and introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, really looking forward to our time together in our breakout room. Um, my name is Autumn. I use they, them pronouns. I've been on the team for well over a half a year now, uh, which is pretty exciting because it's a pretty great team. I am a research scientist, so I help um, pretty directly with our clients to uh, make sure that the any public uh, insights that they're gathering are intentional. So we're making sure that the, the questions we're being asked are ethical um, and equitable, and also that we interpret any responses in those same veins of ethical, um, equitably, but then also rigorously. So um, with a, quite a bit of academic training in that realm, uh, that's what I tend to bring to the team. Taisha, pass it over to you. Hey, everybody. Um, it's great to see you all here today. Uh, this is my third New York City Open Data Week event, and it's among some of my favorite events to be a part of. Um, I'm the founder of Seam Social Labs. I'm a born and bred New Yorker. Grew up in Brooklyn, specifically in Bushwick. So shout out to anyone in or from Brooklyn, but also shout out to my fellow New Yorkers who are in the room and anybody else. I know we have a few folks from other agencies that might be here. Um, my background uh, academically is as an urban sociologist, but even before that, um, I worked in communications and marketing specifically in the public sector. Um, so I have a, a lot of experience in that realm. And I will highlight that I preemptive preemptively dropped a note in the chat. Um, we're hoping that you can all share a little bit more about yourselves as well. But before we get to that, I will pass it back to James. Awesome, thank you, Taisha. Um, so sweet, in the chat, uh, since there's, normally we do a round robin kind of thing, but since there's so many folks, we kind of want to make sure we stay uh, on time and on track. So please feel free to drop in the chat your name, your agency, your expertise, uh, and one takeaway you, you hope to have from today's workshop. Um, and then quickly, just kind of our community rules, no questions or bad questions. Um, stick to I statements uh, and all info shared does not leave this virtual space. No judgments. Equity work takes time and progress. So we have hosted sessions like this and roundtable conversations in the past. When we talk about equity, when we talk about working, you know, especially we're working with the public. We want to make sure that this is a space of learning and a space of growth for people um, where folks, you know, can feel safe and comfortable asking some of those tough questions because they there can be tough conversations that come up. Um, in this space. So without ado, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Ty Asia to begin the chat. All right, y'all. Welcome, welcome. Um, I want to start by saying this is an interactive experience. So um, shout out to the people who are going to be or who will be live in a chat. Love to see it. Thank you, Renata, John, Derek, Matt. Um, hey, Emma, it's great to see you here as well. Hi, Laura. Um, and shout out to everybody who's here today. I know it's not easy to take time out of your day to join a session, um, but our goal is to provide as much value to you, um, especially in the space of open data, because open data was kind of the door that opened possibilities when we started thinking about what do we want to do to empower communities and really truly live our mission. Um, I'm going to kick us off by talking a, about a little thing called HX. Um, in short, HX is the human experience. 
Um, we all have one. We all walk through it day to day. And maybe whether you realize it or not, each of you actually work to enhance the human experience. Um, it's in a specific or through a specific lens. But we're going to actually get to that. Where I want to start is with human communication, because a, a huge part of us even understanding how humans even experience life, how they experience the streets that we design, how they experience the buildings or the workforce programs that we develop is about them being able to communicate. So ages ago, humans evolved and had the ability, started getting the ability to speak. And it started with like grunts and sounds, but then ultimately the human brain, vocal cords and mouth evolved. And we were able to get to the point where we are now, where we have complex human communication that is spoken and written in multiple languages. Um, but as that started to evolve, we realized that there were still small nuances in how we communicated with one another that still impacted how we were able to relay messages. So to kind of um, make up for that, we started utilizing symbols and written word. And that started about 30,000 years ago. It really helped us have a more cohesive ability to communicate with one another, have a shared understanding of words and phrases, and also led into major technological innovations, right? So we had the printing press that came out and that changed everything with um, who had access to books and getting books out, newspapers out, information out. Um, and that's even changed even more so in the past 20 to 30 years when it comes to technology, as in the technology we're using right now, the internet, the web, computers, software, and so on. Now, the interesting thing is that symbols and written word are coded. They mean specific things. And one word can mean many different things, which makes it very nuanced and complicated to try to understand a very specific experience. So that's a little bit of what I want to talk about today when we're talking about the human experience. When we do the work that we do in a public sector, our goal is to understand what the needs of our city or our region, our county, our state are. And when you say you want to understand what our city, county, region needs, what you're really saying is I want to understand what people need, what are their experiences so we can make our cities better. But a huge part of being able to understand that is really getting the ability to understand what people are saying. So I'm going to run a little test. I would love to get engagement in the chat to kind of test this out and see if we have mutual or similar experiences in how we communicate. So Brick, can a few people drop in the chat what this word means? Um, I'd love to get some different perspectives on it. Um, the first thing that comes to your mind with the word brick, and then I'll go into some potential definitions. Okay, a building, building block, construction, material, tough. Okay, anybody else? Cold. Okay, lots of lots of building related things. Got you. I'm. I mentioned earlier. I'm a born and bred New Yorker. So when I say it's brick outside, I'm referring to how cold it is. So yes, it is a. Um, it's a slang term used for cold. But brick has many different meanings. From Urban Dictionary, here's just the 11 different definitions that are listed there. This does not include our definitions that are in more traditional dictionaries like Oxford um, that relate to building, construction, how we put things together. Um, I love that Angela said San Diegans are clueless over here. I've mentioned the word brick to people from Virginia, from to people from D.C., to people from the Midwest, and everyone agrees that it is a building. But I have also heard mutual differences in terms of how it's used for slang. So I find that very interesting as well. Um, we also have another term here, finna. Does anyone have an idea of what this can mean? Okay, we got some about to, going to, yeah, good. So this is a shorthand word for I'm fixing to or I'm about to, I'm fitting to go to the store. So this is a term, again, that is colloquially, colloquially used in some neighborhoods. Um, I want to do my final test here. How do you say carbonated drink? I would love to hear how you use, say that to, okay, Coke, soda, lots, okay, lots of sodas. I feel like this is coming from a lot of my Northeasterners here. Pop, we got one pop in there. Okay, oh, two pops. All right, cool. So this is a little map I found online. Um, I did not do extend, extend, extensive research on this, so I don't know how accurate all of this is, but I have heard some of these terms from people across the country in how they say carbonated drink. Um, Texans say cook for everything. That's hilarious. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can communicate. Now, you, as folks who are working as civic leaders, your goal is to understand particular problems that the people in your city or region experience. If you're trying to understand their problems and they're all speaking 
in a certain way and maybe have different terms to express their experiences, it feels almost impossible sometimes to really get to the core of like, wait, what is everyone trying to say? Because someone from the Upper East Side may speak very differently from someone from Brooklyn, but they may have some similarities that go between those. And it's hard as being a civic leader with uh, being in a place with limited capacity, limited budget to be like, ah, yes, I can understand what all these things mean. It's not possible. But this is what we want to talk a little bit about today, getting into using open data to understand people's experiences. Because um, one of my favorite quotes that comes from Audre Lorde is that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle. Oftentimes we jump into open data and we think the first thing we can look at if we're trying to consider issues with housing is all of the data on housing, right? Like what is the poverty density? What is the average cost of housing in this neighborhood? What's the average income? But there's so much more that we need in terms of context to really get us to understand what is going on in this neighborhood and how do we design a solution for that particular problem? Um, I wanna highlight one of my favorite researchers who kind of kicked off the field and is known as like the founding father of urban sociology and that's W.E.B. Du Bois. A lot of his work, was rooted in understanding experiences and not just through the lens of one problem, but like what is the interconnection of problems that exist in this particular city and how can we address them? So he was one of the pioneers of what we typically call mixed methods now, which is where we're looking at quantitative data or numbers and qualitative data. And a lot of um, researchers and practitioners know him for his work in data visualizations. He was also one of the um, first people to hire an actual painter or artist to sketch out U.S. Census data. And what we see here is from the Seventh Ward of Philadelphia. And this was over 100 years ago in the early 1900. But what Du Bois also knew is that it was really important to get the word of the people to contextualize this information that we see here. So in the early 1900s, when he was studying at um, school and in living in Philadelphia, his goal was to understand the experience of Black people in the Seventh Ward of Philadelphia and ultimately, he did all the work of gathering this quantitative data, but then went around and actually spoke to people. And he interviewed over 5,000 people to come up with the final um, publication that he made, which was called The Philadelphia Negro. And it expressed the Black experience through the lens of people who lived in that seventh ward of Philadelphia. Now, I think the challenge that we sometimes experience in the public sector, especially in a city like New York City, is there like 8 million plus people living here? So the notion or the concept of being like, I've got to get there and interview 5,000 people seems almost impossible. But this is where we can actually tap into open data. And I'll get into that in one second, because first, I want to highlight the type of data we're going to be looking at today. Um, we love to look at data beyond numbers. So that means we want to understand the civic experience of people living in different districts of New York City, but we don't wanna look at the numbers. We wanna actually look at what people are saying. Um, overall in the world, over 80% of data collected is quantitative. It's coded into mathematical terms. And we have these variables and integers that are used and we have a huge scale of that data, but it doesn't provide us with much depth. Qualitative data or text form narrative-based data is much easier to get context out of, but it becomes more challenging to analyze because it is so nuanced because someone may say soda or someone may say brick. And when you're looking at it, it can mean one thing, but when someone else looks at it, it can mean something completely different. So it requires a lot more dynamic analysis and a lot more um, interesting and dynamic approach to understand that. So we're actually gonna be tackling um, one of my favorite pieces of open data, which is actually the community district statement of needs which are these PDF documents that are wrapped up into open data, but they actually are broken up by the community districts. And there's over 30 of them, I believe, in New York City. And they tap into people actually expressing and openly saying what we need. Um, another way you can look at this is utilizing something like social media, Twitter, Reddit, Facebook. These are all areas where living data is live every single day and it taps into people's experience. Um, before we actually go into the data set, though, we're going to take two steps. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a process called induct inductive topic labeling. That's a method of looking at this data and categorizing it so we can understand what people are saying from it. 
It does require you to get deep into the data. So it is a roll up your sleeves, read through it and really brainstorm it situation. And in most cases, You are working with this data set for some time. You've conducted research on a particular problem. You have this data set. You kind of understand the world of what's going on um, around it before you dive into doing inductive topic labeling. For the sake of our workshop, we're just going to go through some best practices on inductive topic labeling. Then we're going to break up into different Zoom rooms, and we're going to actually look at data that we pulled from the community district statement of needs, and we're going to actually topic label them together in smaller groups. The first thing we need to know, though, is what is inductive topic labeling? And so this is a method of research that is focused on looking at your data without any biases, without any assumptions, and building from it an analysis that comes from the top up. So to give you an example, for deductive, you might take a bunch of data, right? Find if you're trying to understand issues with transit in New York City, you're going to pull from many different sources pull a bunch of different variables, pull that into one system. Let's say it might be in some like analytical tool or dashboard. And you're going to start saying, okay, well, I'm seeing this this theme here. I'm seeing this theme here from all of this data. When we're doing inductive, we typically work with smaller sets of data. Um, An ideal process would be you've done some interviews. You might have pulled some data from um, social media. And it's in smaller batches because you're trying to focus on a specific theme and extract from that what is essentially being set. So here are some of the the key steps or the initial steps to get that done. Um, And this is for us, this is a way we think about how we can actually get the voice of the community to solve a problem and ultimately look at what solutions community members may be highlighting themselves. So the first step is don't make any assumptions about the data set that you're looking at. You're not starting with a theory and saying, oh, this is what I think is here in the data but rather you're just observing and you're just looking at the information that is in front of you. From that, you move to the second stage or the second uh, step, which is getting the perspective on the community voice, right? You're looking for things that you're seeing recurring over and over again. You're taking notes on those respective things to say, hey, we pulled, um, let's say we pulled this data from Twitter. We're looking at what are the recurring themes? What are people saying about New York City transit? for this particular issue that we are researching. And we're noting what the patterns are. Again, without any assumptions about it, but just noting and highlighting what we see over and over again. The third step in this process is to then, once you see the patterns, to lay them out and start to come up with some theories around what the potential problem or what the potential solution is. All of that depends on what you're trying to research. But again, the theories is getting into the very final step of closing out on getting to a solution as opposed to starting with your theory. Um, The next step in it is implementing aspects of human-centered design. So for us and for uh, oftentimes when we're speaking to civic leaders, um, we're not trying to necessarily say, ah, once you collect the data and you get that information, yay, that is the final step. Now you've analyzed it and you have a report. Because we have an obligation to the public, this is a full step, uh, a full cycle of a process meaning that we believe it's important that you take the information that you actually see, you take the pattern, you come up with your theories, and then the next step is to actually go to the public and say, hey, like based off of what the data and information we have about your experience in New York City transit, I, I believe I hear this, I hear this problem, or I believe I see this problem, right? These are using aspects of human-centered design to repeat it back to see if the theories that you've developed are actually on par with what the experience may be, or if they're off. And that gives you the ability to determine if you should proceed and move forward with where your theories are, or if you need to adjust them accordingly. I also wanna highlight if there are any questions about any of these, please drop them in the chat, because I am gonna uh, zip through them pretty fast so we can then jump into the actual like workshop session. Um, The next part comes like once you have your theories, your patterns laid out, Um, That's where the actual topic modeling comes into play. So you're able to then look for keywords that might have come up in your note that might have come up in the data over and over again, and you note those down. You have them documented somewhere. Each keyword, you can assign it to a very specific category. So if there is a specific problem that you keep, you see reoccurring in your data, you're able to say, all right, I'm going to tag this as problem. And when you step back and look at those patterns again that were related to problems, you might see specific keywords that keep coming up. 
using the example of maybe New York City transit, you may say, um, I don't know, like lateness. That might be something that keeps coming up. And you might think, okay, well, there's something here. There's a pattern here with people noting that there is um, late trains. But before we make any assumptions about it, we're just going to put that to the side. Those keywords you put to the side or your are your topic. They are the things that you're going to use to categorize your entire data set. And so when you look at it from a higher level view with your team, you're able to say, hey, here are the key problems we're seeing. They are related to lateness. They are related to X and they are related to Y. And once you get that all completed, in some cases, some institutions will use, um, you know, maybe an AI or machine learning algorithm to actually run through, analyze this and then say, hey, here's all the information sorted in front of me. Um, other institutions will say, hey, I'm not going to use any AI. I'm going to completely do this um, on hand with my own team. And it's going to be more of a collaborative process. So the final step is just getting all that information sorted, set out and starting to think through what your next steps may be. Moving to the next aspect, um, I want to run a little bit of a test here. So we have a small sample of information before we jump into our actual data set in our Zoom rooms. And I want to see if people see reoccurring terms or words here. And from this, are we able to create categories based on those phrases? So everyone take a moment to look at this. And in the chat, if we can drop, what are some patterns you're seeing in this um, very small size sample data set? And if you're seeing patterns, what's a potential category you can make for that? So we'll, we'll hold tight for about 20 seconds while everyone's reading that. Okay, we have one housing issues, affordability, got you, affordable housing. Okay, supporting small businesses, job access, food, public spaces, got you. Okay, love these. Thank you all for sharing those. So those are some of the patterns we're seeing. Um, based on the patterns where we're looking at affordable housing, food, um, public spaces, affordability, equity, small businesses. Is there a category we can assign to perhaps all of these, or if not, to some of them specifically? What would you put as a keyword that relates to most of these things? And it doesn't have to be all of them, but perhaps most. We'll take a few seconds, have you think about that, and you can drop it in the chat. Mm. Quality of life, resources, okay. Accessibility, opportunity, yeah. Any other ones? Livable communities. Okay. Access. Good one. Yes. So all of these are spot on. These are keywords that we can put under, right? Like, because it's very easy to say, oh, well, if people are saying they want affordable housing, the answer is just to get more affordable housing. There was actually a study conducted, and I heard more about this when I was a civic fellow with the Urban Design Forum um, last year. There was a study conducted in East Harlem where they were looking at all numbers and they said, oh, we need to build more affordable housing here. And so when affordable housing started going up, the community actually got frustrated and upset. And everyone was taken aback. What do you mean they're upset? Like, we thought we would need more affordable housing here. When they actually went through a different process and spoke to community members, community members said, yeah, housing affordability is a problem here. But if we actually had jobs, we wouldn't have to worry about that. So what we need is jobs. And what we need is more transit solutions to actually get to those jobs. Because if anyone's familiar with East Harlem, it has like one train, one, well, technically the four, five, and six running through it. But for the 116th, 116th Street stop, um, there's really limited transit opportunity. So like, if you live on 123rd all the way out east, it's pretty much a desert out there. There's not other ways to really commute. Um, so that was really at the core of the problem, not just getting another building up, but actually giving us options to get to places where more jobs exist. So that's why a keyword like access, resources, quality of life would be more important and more valuable in designing that solution. Um, we went through the basic steps to do this. I'm just gonna keep this up before we jump into our data set um, because, uh, and I'll run through it again because we are actually about to split up into Zoom rooms and spend a few minutes in those Zoom rooms together actually looking at data that comes from, let me see if I got this up. I think I have it up over here and I could switch it around really quick. Let's see if that's up. Um, that comes from the statement of needs, or excuse me, statement of community district needs. We're gonna be looking at community districts nine and five specifically. And we've already pulled the data out of the PDF document and we have it set up on a spreadsheet. And so we will be moving into those rooms. But before we do that, I just wanna run through the steps again. So you're gonna create categories, based on the existing data sets that we have. 
We're going to try to segment those categories um, as we see the patterns reoccurring. We're going to notice nuanced differences in it, right, and pay attention to the language that people use when they're talking about a particular problem. And as we do this, we're going to have a spreadsheet up and we're going to ask the group that we're with collaboratively to come up with what are the patterns that we see here? What is the keyword we would put this under? And then at the end, we're going to look at some of our actual like responses with keywords, and we're going to compare those to the categories that are actually put under in the statement of needs to see if, are they matching up? Is there other information that we were able to extract out of this data that would be valuable to present into a community board? And I'm just going to close out with any shared learnings. Um, feel free to just jump in and unmute and share it or drop it in the chat. Um, I'll just unmute really quickly. Sorry, James. Um, even though I just want to highlight that our Zoom room had people from different cities, but I definitely saw like a common thread in terms of um, an ability to be like, ah, yes, that's a common issue here. Here's a keyword we can put for it. And we know that that might be a common issue because of X, Y, and Z. So there's kind of like a, a mutual, um, I would say, or the collaboration wasn't challenging at all because there's a mutual understanding of some of the challenges that persist in the public sector or working for the city um, and like being able to glean information outside of or extract information from the data made that a lot easier to kind of like navigate. Yeah, I think um, our group towards the end there just started to think, to talk about exactly that labor intensive uh, aspect that Laura is referring to. Um, and in terms of what we, we, I think, you know, we in <laughs> however many minutes that was can't truly get to the core root issues of a community on just these comments. Um, but it was interesting to see, I think, how how interconnected quite a few of them were just in terms of, you know, we were seeing like rats, cleanliness, um, modernization, um, you know, uh, fixing things. Um, and, and how all of those were tied into kind of a, qual a quality of life aspect. Um, so didn't quite get to connecting all those dots or making those Venn diagrams or connections. But uh, I think, as Laura said, the, the more time you spend in that, um, the more you can get to those, those direct connections. So just wanted to see if there were any questions before we close out formally uh, about the workshop, about the inductive topic labeling. Uh, anything of the sorts. Again, feel free to unmute, unmute uh, and ask them or drop them in the chat. And I'll just give everybody like a minute to sit on that. Have you come across any standard uh, being used in terms of methods or data uh, collection uh, for being used in government? <laughs> I like looking at Autumn Space and it's being like, I think um, I, I, I'll kind of just kick in and say, I think one of the biggest challenges when it comes to this particular process and specifically looking at data that involves a community voice and tech space, there isn't a standard where if you're talking about like performance metrics, there's cl something closer to a standard that I've seen across cities there. Um, and even that skews a bit, but with this is just very, um, it's just very like, it, and it could differ by agency within a city. Like I've seen it different for a transit agency versus a public health agency in the same city on how they like go about the process. And I think it's because it isn't officially a best practice. Um, even though I always like to say, even though most city employees don't necessarily think about it, they are using mixed methods all the time because they have to go through the process of understanding the public voice. Um, and they do host public hearing meetings, but we don't apply it in a sense of like, oh yeah, you are getting this type of data. You should go through this process. So it's still in the works and it's still a, needs to be a growing uh, consensus around that actually happening to inform a best practice. I was going to say anything to add, but I see uh, we have been agreeing. Um, what, <laughs> that's it, that was a great question. Thank you. Uh, I want to jump down to the chat. Uh, Bree asks, would love to learn about what methods are out there to automate topic, uh, topic modeling. Um, I know that I could speak to after this uh, a bit of what we have on our end that can automate that process. Atasia, Autumn, any thoughts on tools outside of senior social labs? Yeah, some of the the ones that I was mentioning to to group number two, I think we were um, Tagit, T A G U E T T E. 
doesn't automate, but does make this process a little bit more easy um, than Excel. Um, Laura, last minute, asked me about Airtable. And I think that might be a good place too, to kind of be able to move through databases. Once you have something coded, you could make a different visualization of just the things that have been coded with that label. Um, NVivo, N-V-I-V-O, is expensive and is what the academics use to do this work, but it is the the tool. And again, it doesn't it doesn't actually do the automating of the process. It just makes it so that once you have the codes in there, you can you can manipulate it quite a bit, but it doesn't it doesn't do that automation. So really, yeah, the <laughs> the automation part is is hard because human language is hard, as Taisha was speaking to earlier. So we haven't quite figured that out as an industry um, quite yet, but we're working on it. James, you can take it from there. Yeah, I also want to add one more thing into that. And with when it comes to AI, there's that spectrum of like supervised all the way to unsupervised. And um, if when you're looking up these tools, try to find out you know, they might have it somewhere on their language on whether it's supervised, unsupervised, or semi-supervised. Because they're supervised and semi-supervised are working with models that are trained on past data, um, which can inform biases. And the whole purpose of like walking into this process is to not have those biases. So an unsupervised model would be ideal, but those are also a little bit harder to find. So then the process can be going with a semi or supervised model. And that can be built into like the tool that you're using, but then going back and just double checking it to see if something just doesn't, if the math ain't mapping somewhere essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that kind of segued right into Brian's question, which was thoughts on using AI or machine learning to do this work. Um, I am by no means an expert in AI or machine learning. I'm a former English teacher. <laughs> so that is where my expertise lies. Um, but I will say based on my, yes, I see the touch. Thank you. The public servants, uh, public servant work. Um, I will say though, you know, to my limited knowledge, I do know that, you know, similar to echo Taija's sentiments, using AI and machine learning, you know, it, it can be done and it can make this so much easier. Uh, but there's that, there's that other side of it that can make it really scary. Uh, where that date, those models can do more harm than good. So I think, you know, thoughts on using it, it's great if it's gonna be good. Uh, but I think, you know, history has shown that very often those things tend not to be good because the people who build them are not building them with equity and inclusion in mind. And those models are really focused and targeted on helping certain groups of people. Um, I'll leave that there. Oh, we got another question. Um, we certainly don't have time to comment the digital divide. We don't, unfortunately. Um, but at the city, we struggle to get our surveys slash feedback from communities with less access to Wi-Fi, wi -Fi, phone, computers, et cetera. Any quick tips for how y'all try to begin closing that gap? Um, I can jump in on that one to start off and then pass along to the team because uh, I work directly with most of our clients. And we do have uh, quite a handful of government government clients. Um, an omni-channel approach uh, is what I suggest to folks uh, always. So covering all your bases, and that includes you know like in a combination of in-person events, virtual virtual communications, using social media, um, using SMS if possible, using the digital assets you have. Um, I think I think that you anybody doing community engagement will always not hit 100% of the demographics they want, and it's just not realistic to try to aim for that. Um, but if you change the perspective to we're going to build out within right within capacity and budget because some of those things are outside of your control within capacity and budget, we're going to build out the most omni-channel approach that we can build out. And if you do that, then you'll get you know as much feedback as you would possibly have have gotten within your capacity and budget. So at the end of the day, you can look at the end result and say, we did the we did closest to the best we could with with the tools given to us. Um, and then, you know, just to like give a bit more concrete examples for specifically communities that aren't connected, um, looking at those cultural institutions and trusted leaders in those communities, building those relationships and leveraging them in positive ways. Um, so for example, Born, born and raised Brooklyn as well. Um, um, Black and Hispanic the barbershop was a place where information was exchanged. So if you know if you wanted to tell 16 year old James something important, um, my barber was probably a really good resource because I was in there every Sunday to get a fresh cut for school on Monday because I did not want to get made fun. So every Sunday I was in the barbershop. Sometimes every Sunday and Friday if I was going to do something on the weekend, um, and it would have been a great source of information. 
because I also trusted my barber. Like I was, I trusted, I trusted him with not being made fun of in school. So that was a lot of trust inherently with, 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 uh, with him. And that would have been a great institution to, you know, divulge information and partner with from a city's perspective to, you know, say, Hey, we want to reach the youth. We want to do it through barbershops. So I just think, I don't like saying getting creative, um, for a variety of reasons we'll get into, but, you know, really thinking like, what are the cultural institutions to the different demographics that aren't connected and that we aren't hearing from and how can we go to them and say, Hey, we, we want to hear from, from this demographic and we want to partner with for the automated process, aside from what Taisha was saying about like doing research and getting more context on the data you're working with, are there like general like pre-processing you, you'd recommend aside from like the standard of like tokenization, um, stemming, things of that nature? To confirm, John, you're talking about just pre-processing. Um, well, I guess I'll take a step back. Are you talking about the research done before you even get into getting the data or just like, okay, I have the data and now it's time to kind of like clean it? And yeah, before I import it to the system. Right, yeah, like the cleaning and such. Yeah, so um, this is one of those rare situations, especially for qualitative data, where I don't think cleaning is as necessary. Um, depending on the tool that you're using, organize it as best so your import is frictionless into said system. But outside of that, um, because text form data is, um, I think by cleaning it, you're also removing some of the community voice. So that's the stuff you actually want in there. Um, and it's funny because when we work with some cities, like we've worked with like San Francisco and New York and some other cities, and they're like, there's a lot of people cursing about like a particular issue related to right. this one street. Let them curse, right? Because you can run sentiment analysis on that as well. And you already know the obvious answer. Everyone's going to be angry, but it allows you to centralize or um, segment that angry mm -hmm. data or like the negative data. And right. then dig deeper on that. And then you can even parse that out and say, I'm going to topic label only this because mm -hmm. there's something deep in here that I need to figure out because everyone's like really frustrated. So um, I'd, I'd zilch on the cleaning, but just the organization of it, make sure that it fits whatever tool you're working with. And I think you're, you're, that's kind of your next step is the analysis part. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. That was a great question. Another um, point oh, sorry, ahead, really quick on that is that it depends on the kind of data, the example that's coming to mind for me is like the difference between like focus group or interview data and uh, like text message survey data. Like when you are analyzing something like an interview transcript, it's important to like take that one whole bucket and like read the whole thing and then reread mm. the whole thing and then reread the whole thing gotcha. and like <laughs> that as, as the data, as like the data point. And then you chunk it up into like this sentence, how does it relate to the question that I'm asking about this topic? Um, and you code it as we did with these specific, you know, more line item things. Um, but it, you know, you take that chunk as the data piece as opposed to cutting it up into sentences because one sentence over here could be related to two sentences before that. You don't wanna lose the context of that thread that that person went through. Okay, so like, yeah, there's a case like it's a larger document thing that makes sense. Yeah. I guess as a follow up question, let's say the input is because we're doing like feedback things in our end to just determine like what we want to add to like school quality reports in the future. Um, so let's say we have a question, right? And there's different responses from different people. So that's like a couple of sentences or so. Would you consider taking that as like one large chunk like you're describing or even even, even that? Okay. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would most likely, it might depend on, <laughs> on the specifics of the questions and the layout of the survey, but um, I would take all the answers to that question and then every answer, no matter how long it is, paragraphs or right. yes, no's, put all of those in a list together and compare in that, like to that question that was asked, the specific question in the survey. Mm -hmm. And then once you have themes under there, you could start to compare other things from other questions. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That's pretty cool. Right, thanks. Thank you for that question. Y'all have been, um, we've done this workshop about two times so far, maybe three. Um, and this has been the most uh, exciting Q&A portion of the work, uh, of all of the groups and all the sessions. Y'all y'all coming through with the heavy hitting question. Um, I'm also, I'm cycling through the participants. I'm loving San Diego. Y'all got energy. Y'all y'all got a lot of energy. Uh, I like it. <laughs> um, we have time for one last question. So it's still early here. It's still early. So <laughs> we're, we're just in a different time zone. Y'all just got the coffee in you. Um, love it. 
So we have time for one more question. If anybody has anything burning that you want to unmute to ask or drop in the chat, again, I'll just give it like a solid 30 seconds to consent on that. Uh, and if not, we'll move over to like closing, closing remarks. I have a question. Um, Autumn, you mentioned at the end of our breakout session that working with other people to sort of divide the work is really helpful. And I'm curious if you have any advice on sort of process with that. Cause I imagine like if you each, if you divide it in thirds, you each go and like do your own coding, you might have different words that are emerging. And so like, at what point do you reconvene to sort of have shared tags and whatnot? Like if you could speak to that, that would be really helpful. Yeah. That is another incredible question. Um, I think, so one of the ways that qualitative analysis can, you know, by folks who have never done it before and never spent a lot of time thinking about how it can be rigorous, you know, the assumption is, oh, one person is coding it. There must be so many assumptions like from that person's perspective in it. In an ideal world, not only would you have other people coding the same data so that you could compare how you were analyzing it and find commonalities between the two of your analyses of the data, you would also then be able to go back to the public that you gathered the data from and say, how does this sound to you? (laughs) Um, and, and ideally, you know, they would be able to even provide you more context on, on what you as, you know, separate folks were agreeing on or disagreeing on. Maybe you both made an incorrect interpretation, um, or three or four or five, but, um, I, I would say it's actually like those differences are, are interesting in and of themselves when you find those differences amongst people who are doing that analysis and, and good call outs. If, for example, you have, you know, four people working on analyzing, you know, five, six different interviews um, and one person notes a theme over here that nobody else caught. Great. Fine. Dandy. You, you just know that those like the themes that everybody agreed on that, you know, three out of four folks agreed on are more likely accurate because there was so much agreement. Um, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, I, oh, sorry. All good. Yeah. No, that's good. Thing. I also wanted to add to that providing, uh, providing a specific example. Um, I'm going to drop this link in the chat. Um, San Francisco County Transportation Authority created a digital game when they were doing, they had a giant study on traffic congestion pricing, which I know New York City is getting into the weeds with now. Um, They started their study about a year and a half ago. We worked with them on it. And a part of what they did was a game. Um, It started pre-pandemic and then they had to digitize it as they got into the heat of the pandemic. But the game actually required um, constituents to give feedback on things that they had, like they conducted interviews, they had public hearing meetings, they extracted all the information. And then in order to get that feedback on like, are we right about these topic labels that we came up with? They created a game and they gamified the whole experience. So the public could give feedback on like, oh yeah, this matters and this doesn't matter. And the game required you to have tokens and you had to um, put down tokens that represented like budget constraints on like what you could and couldn't do. And so they were able to like validate it from there. So the structure of how you can get communities to validate that works in a number of different ways. But that was like one really cool way that allowed them to like say, okay, we are, we're moving in the right direction here or we're, we're moving somewhere, but these are the few things we got to tweak. Awesome. That was a great question. Thank you. I'll end with a quick anecdote um, because it reminds me of uh, in New York city when I don't know if the process is the same. I haven't been a teacher in quite a few years. Um, The English exam, the uh, state exam, the English exam for eighth grade, uh, I know for eighth grade particularly, when it's graded, it gets passed to one teacher who grades it uh, and scores it, and then another teacher scores it. And if the scores are, if there's too much of a difference in the scores, then they have a third person come in to be like, hey, what's going on here? Um, And those teachers don't necessarily have to be English teachers. And I used to be so upset, like, why is a science teacher grading my, like, grading my students' work? Like, there's no way that this science teacher is going to, like, do this the right way. Um, But upon reflection, it made me think, like, it's so nice to have different people from different backgrounds doing almost like that tagging because I'm in so in the weeds and every English teacher is so in the weeds those two months before the test because we're doing test prep we're like so stuck on it that if you put a bunch of English teachers in a room to grade that those English tests I guarantee that like more kids would not be passing because we would be we would just come with such a specific mindset and probably criticize 
way too harshly. Um, so thank you, Mel. You brought me back to, to teaching days. Um, well, thank you all. This was a great session. Just want to go ahead and end it with um, somebody had to ask a question. I appreciate the structure next to Oh, yes. Thank you, Laura. Um, fellow former educator. Um, somebody asked a question about automating uh, this topic labeling. So I did just want to let y'all know that one of our product skill census um, is a is a dashboard to help folks understand qualitative data easier. And on that dashboard, we do have automat automatic topic labeling um, and data visualizations that allows you to, to analyze and get insights on your qualitative data sets um, pretty much in real time depending on the type of data set. I know Taisha did drop her Calendly link before. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and drop it again. If you're interested in talking about topic labeling, or if you're interested in learning more about like the way that we have that automated here at Close Census and how we could potentially partner, please feel free to grab some time on her calendar, um, or you can shoot me an email directly. I believe you all have my email.